So good morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon to some, good evening. Buenos dias, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. A special welcome uh, from uh, me here in Vancouver uh, to our friends in Chile joining us today. My name is Jeff Nankaval, and I am the president and CEO of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. Uh, I may be a new face to some of you who have been following this series uh, on ASEAN and the Americas, which we launched in June. And that's because I just took up my post uh, last week. And in fact, this is uh, my first uh, public event as the president and CEO of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. And I'm thrilled uh, to be doing it together with our colleagues uh, from Chile. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you today to this panel discussion on international governance and the future of digital trade in Canada, Chile, ASEAN and beyond. Now, before I begin, I recognize that many of you are joining from us from across the world and from multiple time zones in Canada, Chile, and across the Asia Pacific region. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that the places Canadians call home are the traditional territories of many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. APF Canada is itself headquartered, and I am speaking to you this morning from the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil people. We're grateful to Canada's Indigenous peoples for their stewardship of the lands on which we live, work, and play. And we at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada are collectively committed to a process of reconciliation. Now, IPF Canada and the Chile Pacific Foundation signed a memorandum of understanding back in 2019 recognizing at the time the potential for mutual collaboration. We're both ABAC secretariats for our home economies. That's the uh, APEC Business Advisory Council. Uh, Pacific nations that literally face the immense and diverse economic opportunities in Asia from the same shore of the Pacific. Uh, we share a commitment to promoting dialogue and understanding around strategic engagement in the region. And this series of roundtable discussions is intended to identify areas where our interests could be amplified by mutual understanding, particularly in the areas changing geopolitical realities, trade, architecture, regional engagement in ASEAN, and in particular, and of course, today's topic, digital trade. So before I turn over the floor to the chair of the board of directors of APF Canada, Pierre Pettigrew, allow me to say just a few words uh, about uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, will be available on our, our website uh, shortly afterwards. Uh, the webinar is being hosted in English with simultaneous translation in Spanish, and you can find the translate button at the bottom of your screen. We encourage your questions and comments. Please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. Now, given the subject and the large audience we've gathered, we apologize in advance if there isn't a chance to answer your question live, but there will be follow-up. And for technical support, please reach out to Mandy at the email address events at asiapacific.ca. And now it's my great honor uh, for the first time in my capacity uh, publicly to introduce the chair of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada Board of Directors, Monsieur Pierre Pettigrew. Pierre, over to you. Thank you so much, Jeff, and welcome to your new job and best of luck in your mandate. Uh, welcome as well to the whole Asia Pacific Foundation Canada team. Loreto, buenas tardes. It is lovely to see you again after our summer break and your winter and to continue this important partnership and dialogue on areas of uh, mutual interest to Canada and Chile. This is actually the third in a series of four panel discussions on ASEAN and the Americas with our friends at the Chile Pacific Foundation. The first two panels were held in June and laid the important groundwork for today's discussion. Our first session focused on the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership and the challenges and opportunities Southeast Asia presents for our respective economies, both co-signatories of the CPTPP. Our panel of experts provided wonderful commentary on the potential for trade and investment for ASEAN economies 
best practices for engagement for countries like Canada and Chile and the future of partnerships in our approach to the region. For the second part of the series, our panel of experts discussed some of the larger geopolitical issues affecting ASEAN as an institution, its member states and regional stability more generally, especially the impact of the US-China competition. Our panelists highlighted the continued need for diplomacy and forms of bilateral and multilateral engagement that both Canada and Chile could explore as a middle path to navigating the larger geostrategic challenges in the region. Well, today we have convened another expert panel to discuss what is perhaps the most opportunity rich and disruptive agent of change in global trade the digital economy. It is no exaggeration to say that the, the digital revolution is taking place all across the world, but member states in ASEAN are pivoting especially quickly. They have been leaders in developing e-commerce pathways, regulatory frameworks, and models for international coordination, including Singapore's participation in the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement along with New Zealand and, of course, Chile. It is an opportune moment to discuss ways in which we can scale our dig digital assets and influence the global regulatory landscape. Canada and Chile are uniquely positioned as democratic middle powers to have a positive impact on the direction of the digital future. So Jeff, let me hand the floor back to you to introduce our moderator and speakers for today. And here I am. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Pierre. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, Ms. Loretto Leighton, Executive Director of the Chile Pacific Foundation, who will be the moderator for today's discussion. Now, Ms. Layton has served as the Executive Director of the APEC Business Advisory Council, or ABAC, during 2019, and is a former diplomat of the Chilean Foreign Service. She has served, among other postings, five years in the Embassy of Chile in Argentina, five years at the Mission of Chile to the UN, two years as Senior Advisor to the Secretary General of the Organization of American States. She has ample experience in international negotiations and affairs, and during her work at the UN, she was elected Vice President of the Third Committee of the General Assembly and Vice President of the Commission on the Status of Women, both on behalf of Latin America. Uh, we're delighted to have Loretto as our, as our partner uh, between the two foundations, and I now turn the floor over to you, Loretto. Thank you so much, Jeff, and we are also delighted to be having these webinars uh, with, together with your foundation. And we hope to continue doing so uh, for a longer time and, and on another topic as well. And also thank you very much, Pierre, uh, for your remarks, which have provided us with a perfect framework to assess today's webinars topic. Well, as you say, my name is Loreto Leighton, Executive Director of the Chile Pacific Foundation. And let me stress how proud we are at the foundation to tip up with the Asia Pacific Foundation to carry on this series around the rising importance of ASEAN for Canadian and Chilean international trade, among other subjects. At the Chile Pacific Foundation, we strive to encourage and promote public private initiatives aiming to underscore the strategic importance of the Indo Pacific region to our country. And this activity that I have the honor to moderate today constitutes a top-notch example of the foundation's objective. This said, let me introduce you now to Mr. Alex Peso, a close friend and collaborator who will provide a brief scene setting remarks on behalf of the Chile Pacific Foundation. Alex is currently legal and corporate affairs director for Microsoft Chile and director at the Chilean Association of Information Technology, ACTI. From 1999 to 2006, Alex served as chief counsel and deputy director of Telecompra, which is the national purchase office in Chile. Alex holds a law degree from Universidad de Chile, 
and a master's degree in constitutional law from Universidad Católica de Chile. In the academic field, Alex is a professor of the Diploma of Personal Data and Artificial Intelligence at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. So having introduced you, Alex, you have the floor now to make your, present, your introductory remarks. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Loreto. Y primero que nada, quiero agradecer a la Fundación Chilena del Pacífico por la invitación a hacer esta apertura. Eh, y quisiera hablarles de lo que realmente más sé, que es eh, en los desafíos regulatorios que están en este minuto dando cuenta de esta tremenda transformación digital que está viviendo el mundo, que está viviendo Latinoamérica y Chile en particular. El comercio electrónico, como ustedes saben, se aceleró de una manera impresionante por la pandemia y en Chile estamos viviendo una verdadera oleada de nuevas regulaciones que vienen a intentar regular esta era digital y este comercio electrónico. En primer lugar, una muy buena noticia. A partir de noviembre de este año vamos a tener vigente el acuerdo que suscribimos con Nueva Zelanda y Singapur. Un acuerdo de cooperación para la economía digital. Es un acuerdo que nos va a permitir regular el libre flujo de datos, nos va a permitir evitar la discriminación digital, regular acuerdos en materia de ciberseguridad con estos dos países, pero ciertamente que se va a convertir además en un marco general de regulación para Chile. Una segunda novedad es eh, el nuevo reglamento de comercio electrónico que acaba de dictar el gobierno de Chile y que por primera vez ya empieza a diferenciar y empieza a explicar la diferencia que hay entre quienes venden en este comercio electrónico digital y quienes operan las plataformas y cada uno con sus responsabilidades eh, y, y con sus deberes y obligaciones. Un tercer aspecto que ha sido muy destacado en la última semana por la prensa es una nueva regulación dictada por el, por el Senado de Chile eh, respecto de las plataformas digitales. Eh, tenemos ahí una regulación que intenta regular a Facebook, a Google, a Instagram, a Twitter, en temas que tienen que ver con la pornografía infantil y que tienen que ver con establecer el derecho al olvido, el, el, el derecho a bajar ciertos contenidos. Y esto trae obviamente siempre desafíos respecto de los temas de, libre, de libertad de expresión, desafíos respecto de quién va a determinar quiénes son los contenidos perniciosos, etc. Tenemos un cuarto desafío muy importante en materia de datos personales en Chile. Recientemente, el, el gobierno de Chile, a través de una indicación, le ha entregado facultades al, a nuestra agencia de consumidor nacional, al CERNAC, para que conozca sobre materias de protección de datos cuando hay intereses colectivos respecto de consumidores. En Chile, como ustedes podrán saber, no tenemos hoy día todavía una agencia de datos personales. Tenemos una ley del año 1999. Además, recientemente el presidente de la República informó que va a establecer una agencia de datos personales que va a depender del Ministerio de Economía. Eh, no conocemos el contenido de, esa nueva, de ese nuevo anuncio eh, y esperamos que se trate de una agencia efectivamente autónoma eh, y especializada que nos permita cumplir con los estándares. Otra novedad también reciente. Eh, la dictación de una norma general fintech para regular los servicios financieros en Chile y establecer eh, un nuevo sistema de open finance en Chile, eh, entregando obligaciones de información y entregando la posibilidad de que haya más competitividad en el sistema financiero. Es una regulación muy, muy amplia y general que viene a, a modificar y actualizar varias otras normas eh, del mundo financiero. Finalmente, también la semana pasada se dictaron dos normas relacionadas con el acceso a Internet. Una que pretende modificar la Constitución, estableciendo el derecho al, al acceso eh, de Internet en materias de educación, y otra norma de rango legal que modifica la ley de telecomunicaciones, estableciendo acceso también general 
eh, para todas las personas en, en Chile. Como ustedes pueden ver, el marco regulatorio está desafiante. Eh, además, Chile está enfrentando un proceso de reforma constitucional en este mismo minuto mientras estamos conversando. Eh, desde Microsoft estamos muy confiados en que de todo esto salga una mejor regulación y salga finalmente también un mejor país. Incluso hace muy poco tiempo atrás Microsoft anunció eh, una eh, inversión fundamental en data centers en Chile, eh, renovando con eso la confianza que tiene Microsoft en Chile. Termino mis palabras agradeciendo de nuevo a Loreto Leighton y a la Fundación Chilena del Pacífico y deseándoles a ustedes que tengan hoy día una sesión productiva eh, y que puedan efectivamente avanzar en el tema del desarrollo digital y el comercio electrónico. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, for your introductory words. Um, certainly, it's going to trigger some. It's going to take trigger some questions for the for the last part of this session, part of the information that you have provided us. Let me now introduce you uh, our first panelist, Mr. Bart Eds. Bart is a policy analyst, commentator, and author of Learning from Tomorrow, Using Strategic Foresight to Prepare for the Next Big Disruption, written in 2021. He focuses on developing Asian economies, international development, cross-border trade and investment, innovation, social policies, and transformative trends reshaping the world. Between 2001 and 2020, he held senior staff positions at the Asian Development Bank, ADB, most recently serving as the lender's North American representative. While based at ADB's Manila headquarters, he oversaw teams responsible for policy, strategy and operational guidance on education, governance, health, inclusive business, IT for development, knowledge management, poverty reduction, social protection, and stakeholder consultation. He guided the formulation of ADB's landmark public communications policy, explored the impact of climate change on migration in Asia, launched ADB's largest community of practice on social development, and managed partnerships with civil society organizations, donors, and international organizations. Well, having introduced you, Bert, you have the floor. Loreto, thank you very much. Thank you for those kind words. During the COVID-19 pandemic, jobs in Canada's tech sector and technology roles in other sectors jumped to more than 11% of the country's total employment, up from 9.5% before the pandemic. The digital economy jobs in Canada are expected to grow by some 250,000 between now and 2025, reaching 2.26 million. The impact of the digital transformation in the country involves all kinds of service providers from banks and insurers to telecommunication, telecommunications firms and governments. They have harnessed digital technology to improve their operations and interact with clients. The Canadian retailers have expanded their online platforms and made them increasingly user friendly. Digital technologies are also transforming the goods producing and commodity sectors of Canada. Now, these changes affect not only sales within the country, but also sales abroad. Statistics Canada estimates that 57% of Canadian service exports are delivered remotely to other countries, primarily by digital delivery. The, the revised North American Free Trade Agreement known in Canada as CUSMA includes a digital trade chapter intended to facilitate economic and trade opportunities through the internet and address potential barriers to digital trade among Canada and two of its leading trade partners, the US and Mexico. Indeed, Canada's future competitiveness and economic growth prospects are closely linked with the country's ability to seize opportunities created by the digital economy. Next slide, please. Policy Horizons, the organization that helps the Canadian government develop future-oriented policy and programs through use of strategic foresight, has identified eight digital technologies that are maturing and combining to change the economy. These are 
the internet of things, which provides a network of physical objects or things that are embedded with sensors, software, and other technologies for the purpose of connecting and exchanging data with other devices and systems over the internet. Artificial intelligence is fast becoming the backbone of the digital economy in the business world. Meanwhile, robotics will perform physical labor and provide an embedded platform for AI. Advanced telepresence will allow us to project ourselves and our expertise anywhere in the world that is connected to networks. Virtual reality will offer immersive non-physical worlds, while advanced materials will enable the production of micro and nanoscale devices that can bring digitization to many new areas at low power. Decentralized production technologies will be significant. For example, 3D printing can be used locally, or rather can use locally available inputs, including new biomaterials to manufacture countless products on demand for local markets. And finally, blockchain technologies are creating unique non-copyable digital assets. And this enables secure, low-cost transactions between parties who don't know each other. Next slide, please. One market that Canada should target as it expands digital trade is 10-member ASEAN, which boasts a population of 676 million and a booming middle class. The five largest developing country economies of the bloc grew at a high annual average of more than 5% between 2010 and 2019. ASEAN is on track to become the world's fourth largest economy by 2030. It also has a comparatively young demographic profile with nearly two thirds of the population under the age of 35. The COVID-19 introduced a massive digital adoption spurt in ASEAN economies. Research conducted last year in Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam showed that over one third of consumers are new to digital platforms and over 90% say they intend to continue using those platforms after the pandemic. Southeast Asia added an incredible 40 million new internet users in 2020 taking to 400 million, the number of people online in the region. Canada is exploring a free trade agreement with ASEAN and recently concluded public consultations on a possible comprehensive economic partnership agreement with Indonesia and on joining the digital economy partnership agreement, which we'll hear more, more about uh, later in this, uh, this panel discussion. Last slide, please. Canada has always been more effective uh, in the international realm when it partners with others. A Canada-Chile partnership promoting modern rules for international digital trade would build on strong common bounds. Both countries are vi uh, vibrant democracies in the Western hemisphere boasting market-based economies. They, they are also fast adopters of new technologies and are actively engaged in the global economy. Exports are important to both countries which from their Western coastlines open up to the Pacific and to Asia beyond. Canada and Chile have a bilateral free trade agreement and have since 1997. And Chile is Canada's top direct investment destination in South and Central America. Importantly, Canada and Chile are both members of key international organizations promoting commerce across the Pacific, including APEC, and of course the CPTPP. They are, they are also shareholders in the Inter-American Development Bank, the IADB, which invests in economic and social development in a large geographic region of the Western Hemisphere. Among other things, the IADB is helping to build the capacity of its low and middle income countries to engage in trade, including digital trade. Canada and Chile are also members of the OECD, which sets standards and highlights good practice in a range of economic sectors. The OECD is helping policymakers better identify and respond to emerging challenges arising from digitization. For example, the OECD is analyzing issues related to defining and measuring digital trade, what market openness means in the digital era, data flow regulation, and the impact of new technologies on trade policy. The OECD maintains an inventory of rules, principles, and standards that are of importance to digital trade. The inventory is intended to enable more informed discussions on digital trade at the WTO 
in other international organizations and in shaping domestic policies. Both Canada and Chile are founding members of the WTO. They were among the subset of WTO members that in December of 2017 issued a joint statement announcing exploratory work on future WTO negotiations on trade related aspects of electronic commerce. In addition, Canada and Chile are part of the Ottawa Group of Trading Nations, which aims to achieve meaningful, realistic, and pragmatic reform of the WTO. And these are just a few examples of international organizations and forums in which Canada and Chile are involved and influence the course of research, capacity development, deliberations, and negotiations in areas connected with digital trade. As middle powers committed to international cooperation, Canada and Chile can, in some circumstances, build trust and put others at ease in a way that larger, more powerful countries cannot. This is a great advantage when exploring how the two countries can influence the regulatory framework for digital trade. Now, in, in concluding my introductory remarks, I would note that if Canada and Chile decide to jointly advance ideas for regulating digital trade, they ought to coordinate closely with Singapore, which has been at the vanguard of negotiating international agreements in this space. Singapore is already building on the path-breaking DEPA by holding discussions on digital trade agreements with other countries, including Vietnam. Canada and Chile should also move quickly to maximize their joint influence in digital trade rules setting. More countries outside of Asia are exploring digital trade agreements as recognition grows that digital technology is evolving at a much faster pace than the policies aimed at governing their trade, usage, and security. For example, the EU intends to establish a digital partnership agreement with Japan, South Korea, and Singapore as part of its new Indo-Pacific strategy. And south of the Canadian border, the Biden administration is discussing proposals for a digital trade agreement covering the Indo-Pacific economies. The White House reportedly envisions Canada and Chile as being part of this massive digital trade accord. Such a development would provide a prime opportunity for Canada and Chile to exert their influence and build international standing as advocates for well-regulated digital trade. Thanks very much, Loida. Many thanks for your presentation, Bart, which has introduced us into a number of crucial aspects as to digital trade that I am sure will be part of the discussion later on during the Q&A session. I will now introduce our second panelist, Jonathan Fried. Mr. Jonathan Fritz's distinguished diplomatic career for Canada spanned law, economics, and trade. Prior to his retirement in August 2020, he was coordinator for international economic relations at Global Affairs Canada with a mandate to ensure coherent policy positions and government-wide strategic planning in international economic fora regarding both current and forward issues including responses to the COVID-19 pandemic and Canada, Asia and other international trade and economic matters. From 2017 to early 2020, he was the personal representative of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau for the G20. Previously, Mr. Fried served as ambassador and permanent representative to the WTO Ambassador to Japan, Executive Director for Canada, Ireland, and the Caribbean at the IMF, Senior Foreign Policy Advisor to the Prime Minister, Senior Assistant Deputy Minister for the Department of Finance and Canada's G7 and G20 Finance Deputy. He was formerly Canada's Chief Negotiator, Negotiator on China's WTO accession, Chief Counsel for NAFTA, and Counselor for Congressional and Legal Affairs at the Canadian Embassy in Washington, DC. Jonathan, you have the floor. Loretta, thank you very, very much. I'm going to jump uh, right in in light of the time and uh, I will invite uh, participants to have reference uh, to the slides as, as we go. I'm speaking to you from Southwestern Quebec uh, which is the unceded territory of the Algonquin and, Nish and Nishinaabeg people. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be living in this environment. 
So let me uh, uh, put our discussion into a slightly broader context and uh, maybe go back to some underlying uh, frameworks and principles. You know, it's very commonplace to talk about global value chains and regional value chains. In fact, Pascal Lamy, the former DG of the WTO and former European Trade Commissioner, uh, has been very fond of reminding us all that today many goods are made in the world. Add another dimension to that in this digital age. Uh, and I believe it was the Swedish Board of Trade that uh, some years ago added a difficult word to the English language and to our lexicon, namely uh, the servicification of goods. In other words, that embedded in the production of virtually any physical and tangible item today lies a range of services, including uh, electronic and, and digital elements. So the first, uh, this first slide in the upper left, uh, which is also taken from the Swedish Board of Trade, offers a very stylized uh, chain of production, whether regional or global, from conception uh, to final sale. And in this simple graph, it shows a number of things. First, that for a design or a conception, to reach a producer, let alone a consumer, some means of transmission is required. And in today's world, it may be obvious, but I think it's important to pause on the reality that with all respect to the Canada Post and the Postal Service of other countries, this increasingly tends to be by electronic means. Second, uh, thing that comes out from this chart is that the producer or manufacturer needs raw material and often some intermediate goods or some processing of that raw material as the basis for the production of this design or finished good. A semiconductor chip, for example, is said to travel the world as silicon is mined, shipped to another country to produce a wafer which then moves to yet another country to be precision cut and to yet another country to be integrated into a chip, which is then sent on to yet another location for integration to a computer or phone or in today's world of the, the internet of things, even a refrigerator. And the ultimate market may of course then be in yet an, another country. So uh, the global uh, supply chain is not just raw material into a factory, but several stages involving several uh, countries. And third lesson, as I, uh, as I hinted at, is that at each stage, a range of services are embedded in this production chain. Accountants, lawyers, shippers, telecommunication providers, bankers, financiers are all also part of this supply chain. With that as background, the lower right, uh, which is a graphic very familiar to economists, uh, portrays what is often called the smile curve of global production in uh, recent decades. So what it tells us is far from a portrayal of China alone as the so-called factory of the world, it reflects the reality that value added and profits and income at both the start and the end of the production cycle tend to be concentrated in developed economies where the more labor intensive physical production remains in lower cost, lower wage countries. Now, time doesn't permit us to grapple with this very important issue of inequality and poverty, but let me just uh, note that uh, two things. One, that when we hear calls from developing countries going back some decades now for rebalancing in the international economic order, there's some genuine justification in those calls. Second, the advent of 3D printing and the increasingly decentralized character of manufacturing may in fact aggravate rather than mitigate uh, these inequalities. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. 
Um, so the digital dimension uh, uh, is uh, really the focus of the entire panel today. Uh, and we've just seen that the flow of data is an integral part of both production and the services behind it. But a range of barriers can and does interfere with the smooth flow of information. So let me unpack uh, that uh, a bit. I don't know uh, if you can see the bottom of the slide and, and the legend of, of the coloring in terms of who's blocking what. Uh, you will note that Canada is in the middle of the pack in terms of having a number of restrictions on the flow of data. Chile, uh, on the other hand, is uh, quite open. Um, so uh, let's uh, move on from here uh, to look at the type of barriers uh, that are involved. And far from being all trade related, uh, you'll note in the left-hand column that government uh, measures are not limited uh, to trade, but nor are they limited to digital specific or informatic specific policies that can interfere. Areas as diverse as taxation, competition policy, intellectual property laws, and even general laws on such things as consumer protection and liability all have an impact on how smoothly uh, data can flow. And the, the right-hand column reminds us that although there's so much public attention on personal information and privacy, the European GDPR, for example, as being uh, the real gum in the works that interferes with data flow, the, interestingly enough, the area of greatest regulatory focus is in fact on financial and related data. Now, that column admittedly only shows uh, or counts countries that block uh, the transfer of data. Many more countries, as opposed to the number of countries counted in this chart, many more countries regulate or restrict the data. So what's the lesson of this page? In effect, that barriers to uh, data flows uh, are pervasive and uh, are, uh, one might say everybody's doing it because various countries at all levels of development have through their application of laws, standards uh, uh, in various areas, uh, an impact on uh, the ability of business to take advantage of the efficiencies that would flow in pursuing uh, modern supply chains, uh, relying on, on the flow of data. So let me go on just to put this all into context uh, before we hear from my dear friend, uh, the vice minister on DEPA in particular. So the next slide, was produced by Fahid uh, Chahadi, who was formerly the head of ICANN. It was produced in 2015. Admittedly, it needs a bit of updating, but what it shows is just how many areas of regulation and of government engagement in the economy are implicated when one tries to look at how data is governed, both nationally and international. And if you run down the right-hand column of who are the actors, you will see in addition to national governments and in addition to whatever is said in trade agreements, you've got all sorts of other players. Um, you've got, depending on the area, law enforcement agencies, because we have to be concerned about security. You have, of course, the private sector itself, uh, both uh, sectorally and through uh, uh, internationally uh, coordinated uh, forums. You have standard setting bodies and uh, you have facilitators such as the World Economic Forum, uh, the UN's Intergovernmental uh, Forum, uh, so-called Internet Governance Forum, uh, various tables for artificial intelligence and so on. 
So the main message uh, uh, I want you to take from this chart is that if we're seeking to create and to sustain an international environment, that facilitates rather than hinders the deployment of digital tools for people and for business. The subjects dealt with in the DEPA, in the digital chapters of PRISMA or the USMCA or the CPTPP, the uh, Enforce ASEAN Agreement on Electronic Commerce and similar frameworks are all but a piece of the puzzle and maybe a small piece at that. There's a second uh, message from this graphic. Whether you're talking about undersea cables to, or satellites, for talking about systems for domain names and IP addresses to legal identifiers, two things are, are clear. First, to just hammer home upon the point, there are a range of international bodies and forums who are directly engaged. And the WTO is but one uh, part of that and its subsidiary for uh, under various bilateral and regional uh, or plurilateral agreements. Second lesson is that rulemaking is increasingly multi-stakeholder in nature and technical experts in the private sector play a growing role in shaping the international regulatory environment. Now, let me give you one example uh, just to illustrate that. I don't know how many of you are aware of something called the Third Generation Partnership Project. It's known as 3GPP, and that's an umbrella uh, organization that brings together uh, a number of standards organizations they develop protocols for mobile telecommunication. Its best known work is uh, they, the, this body, this forum actually develop what are now fairly universally accepted standards for GSM, LTE, 5G, uh, that allows interoperability around the world. Now, who is this consortium? Uh, the core members are seven national and regional telecommunication standards organizations. There are associate members from the market, from the private sector. Um, it's been around since 1998. Uh, and if you're concerned with who's going to control what on 5G and uh, whether your phone can work in a foreign country, it's not going to be captured by a trade agreement. It's going to be captured by what the 3GPP uh, group uh, decides. So uh, final point before moving on, uh, that uh, again, I apologize for repeating myself, but if you run across uh, the top uh, section from left to right, on economic and social issues, you'll again note that governments, whether they act alone at home or internationally in concert with other countries, cannot but through law and regulation in various sectors on health, on education, on finance, have a major impact on how the digital world functions across borders. So let me, uh, uh, move on to the, what is my last slide also for Mr. Chihadi, which drills down a bit more on this economic uh, as well as uh, societal uh, dimension. So again, look at the myriad of actors, national governments, the private sector, civil society, academia, uh, uh, who all uh, play a role. Uh, and uh, don't underestimate the impact of uh, civil society. Uh, for example, there's a globally coordinated artificial intelligence initiative. Even Human Rights Watch uh, has, a, has a voice at various tables. There's an association for progressive communications as it's called. Uh, same thing with international organizations well beyond 
uh, the WTO. And Bart made reference to some of them, but you can add the OECD, UNESCO, the International Telecommunications Union, WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, and even informal for us, such as the International Panel on Artificial Intelligence that Canada and France has uh, championed. Um, and as I mentioned, a number of standards bodies, uh, whether on uh, the International uh, Society for Electrical Engineering, the ISO, uh, and so on. So all this adds up to a reality, not only that there are many subjects, but there are many actors. And let's face it, uh, although we're talking about a number of technical bodies, at the international level, as we're witnessing today, competing interests, and dare I say, competing politics can interfere with the common pursuit of global public goods and interoperability. Think about the current debates at the UN uh, over the control of domain names, 5G standards, and even undersea cables are, are now at issues. So, if you were to take this page and draw circles around each box uh, that are covered by DEPA or the draft WTO e-commerce uh, joint uh, statement and initiative or other similar portion of these subjects are addressed. And add to that the reality that the same subject may be addressed not only by the DEPA, but by the uh, parallel ASEAN framework across regions uh, uh, by virtue of uh, the WTO or other fora, we do run the risk in the digital space of creating a new spaghetti bowl of competing and intersecting frameworks, just as we've done with the 400 some odd free trade agreements that coexist alongside the WTO and overlap with each other. So that leads me to the third point on which I'll conclude, which is at the national level, given all these subjects, think about how many different ministries with different mandates and different imperatives are engaged to foster a comprehensive and integrated understanding of policies and their interaction is a challenge in many capitals. There's an important lesson and inspiration we might take from Australia in this regard, um, where they created Uh, Jonathan, sorry. sorry. I slipped into mute. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not sure where I cut out, but I was going to conclude by just saying, given all these different subjects, uh, and if you think about on the national level, let alone internationally, how many different ministries with different mandates and different imperatives are engaged, how do you go about creating a more comprehensive and integrated understanding of how the development of policies in these different areas may impact on, uh, on the digital economy. And a real lesson can be taken from Australia, who uh, in 2019 created a digital economy task force, but they host it in the office of the prime minister, because that's the only way to ensure coordination across government. Um, and as a result of this, uh, Australia released just in May, a very comprehensive uh, digital economy strategy. So I'm gonna conclude by saying to achieve the international coordination that DEPA and similar agreements strive for depends on coordination at home. And governments throughout the Asia Pacific on both sides of the Pacific and right through to the Indo-Pacific have a fair amount of homework to do in organizing ourselves and in more actively engaging the other stakeholders in this multi-stakeholder regulatory environment. And it's only in that way that we can uh, help ensure that there's better coordination 
at the international level, both in the formal organizations and in these various fora uh, that are implicated in uh, providing uh, hospitable frameworks for the digital economy. So thanks very much for your patience and I look forward to the vice minister's remarks, thanks. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for your presentation. I am sure that many of the topics you have just brought up will trigger an interesting discussion with our audience during the Q&A uh, session. Um, I will introduce now our third panelist who is Chile's Vice Minister of Trade, Mr. Rodrigo Yanez, who is also a director of the Chile Pacific Foundation. Rodrigo Yanez is currently the Vice Minister of Trade of Chile. He has led an intense bilateral agenda of negotiations for new agreements and the modernization of older instruments. In that position, he also had an active participation in multilateral trade forums such as APEC, Pacific Alliance, OECD, WTO, as well as his role as Sherpa in the G20, representing the interests of Chile. Prior to his new position in 2015, he worked as Director of Financial Advisory Services at Deloitte, where he led the Business Intelligence and Anti-Corruption Compliance and Regulatory Advice Service Lines. He was ranked by Chambers and Partners Latin America 2018 as a leading practitioner in the field of compliance. Mr. Yanez was also a member of the Panel on Public Works Concession between 2014 and 2018, board member of Chile's Public Enterprise System between 2013 and 14, and of the International Cooperation Agency Board. Having said all these, Rodrigo, you have the floor, and we are very sure that we're going to listen to very interesting words about the negotiation of DIPA, particularly, that has been mentioned already by our previous, previous panelists. You have the floor. Thank you, Loreto, and thank you, everyone. It's good to see good friends uh, like Jonathan and great panelists also uh, uh, to start with this uh, very interesting panel. And for me, it's um, uh, really... Uh, um, a, a chance to share what, from the trade policy perspective, we've been trying to, to advance and move forward and uh, trying to devise the rules for this next generation uh, trade. And uh, I want to focus on, on, on uh, how we uh, and digital trade, uh, where we are um, in, in Chile, and uh, what's the context out of digital trade. So uh, if we may have the next uh, slide. Um, and we can see that in the last decade, we have uh, seen uh, how digital transformation has fully entered uh, our lives. Uh, this trend accelerated, no doubt about it, uh, given the pandemic and the physical distancing measures also implemented um, have uh, affected all uh, productive sectors from manufacturing to services and mainly every home on the planet. So now using digital devices is uh, or now a, a daily necessity. We need to use and, and, and have the, pand the pandemic as a, as a trigger for uh, uh, this uh, um, accelerated transformation and, uh, and, and the adaptation uh, necessity that companies have in their various processes uh, to satisfy this new and more connected uh, society. In this sense, uh, the figures are very clear. Uh, by 2025, 65% uh, uh, of the world's homes will be connected to the internet and currently 64% of companies are planning to invest in their e-commerce channel in order to be more resilient to future crises and risks. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we can see the dynamism of uh, the digital economy, uh, which is key. Um, we have uh, uh, rates of growth uh, uh, of cross-border e-commerce at an average annual rate of 20%. And this sales channel is expected to grow 52% between now and year 2025, making clear the potential, the immense potential for the development of digital technologies and the internationalization of our economy. In the, in the next slide, I just wish to mention how by 2020, 
uh, Chilean companies um, from different sectors made great efforts to digitize several of their activities, their processes, which raised internet connections to record numbers, reaching 23.7 million connections. And we are a 19 million people country. So 84% of this uh, number of connections were done uh, through mobile devices. So there is a notorious effect of the pandemic in the digitalization of processes, um, which must be certainly noted. Um, and without going any further from March uh, last year onwards, about 3 million internet connections have been uh, added in uh, the country. Therefore, the financial services industries, ICTs, digital infrastructure and logistics have uh, supported each other allowing our economy and our companies to continue to operate despite these complex national and international scenarios. And this uh, is uh, uh, the context where, for instance, in connection with, the, with, 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 with this, the OECD in its report on SMEs and entrepreneurship in the next slide uh, indicated that uh, at the global level, Chilean SMEs were the ones that most increased the digitaliza digitalization of their processes during uh, 2020. In the next slide, um, considering this context is certainly a priority uh, that as a government, we can generate the conditions and ecosystems so that the digital economy can grow on solid uh, foundations, both within our borders, but also outside of them. So in that sense is that the idea of uh, negotiating new agreements emerges, such as the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement or DIPA or its acronym in English, uh, which is, as you now probably well know, a treaty uh, already uh, entered into force between Chile, New Zealand, and uh, Singapore, which is a pioneer agreement, uh, first of its kind, which seeks to promote the collaboration in the field of digital economy by establishing a regulatory and cooperation framework that allows the parties to promote the digital markets. We have uh, uh, also received good news in terms of the official interest of Canada, uh, launching the internal processes uh, of consultation to join this agreement. And also more recently, just a few days, the formalization of the interest of South Korea for um, a formal request of accession to uh, this agreement. And the text of this, uh, uh, of, of DIPA, consists on uh, 16 uh, modules and four annexes uh, where topics such as artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, fintech, digital inclusion, and open uh, development models are incorporated. In the next slide, you can see uh, these chapters and the, the cooperation framework that allows promoting innovation and creativity, the dissemination of information knowledge, technology, culture, and arts, uh, thus creating an open, inclusive, and competitive uh, markets. It's a pioneer agreement, as I said earlier, uh, since uh, in addition to covering the traditional so-called disciplines also include new topics that cannot be found in e-commerce chapters, mainly with a collaborative approach such as artificial intelligence, digital identity, open data, data privacy, cybersecurity, electronic payments, digital inclusion, competition, among others. In the next slide, uh, you can see uh, uh, Further details on the some pillar or um, uh, core principles of the agreement on moratorium and non-discrimination, um, encryption, data protection, free flow of data, and the no localization requirements, which are very practical also uh, from the cost perspective for our SMEs and uh, uh, build this level playing field that we seek to establish for uh, our companies, in particular SMEs to which uh, ex excessive burdens or costs can uh, eliminate uh, uh, the feasibility of uh, them doing business. In the next slide also, uh, you will find um, some uh, uh, elements of what we call this trust ecosystem and how uh, established and structured mechanisms of cooperation in very sensitive issues uh, such as cyber securities and how to look and, and uh, nurture the agreement, uh, which we see as a live, a live agreement uh, from or with opinions of uh, our stakeholders, namely uh, both uh, private uh, and the 
public sector, the civil society, and uh, the way it addresses consumer protection, also articles, um, trying to set uh, you know, the core elements of uh, what in this um, uh, by essential you know, cross-border uh, um, uh, playing field needs to be at the very center, which is trust. In the next uh, slide, um, also the new trends and the emerging technologies uh, uh, that TEPA has in, in terms of uh, the cooperation uh, to promote uh, the development of fintechs, uh, also of uh, new technologies, which does not mean that it's a closed list of uh, topics, as we know that especially in this field, uh, things are ext extremely uh, fast evolving. Um, but we wanted anyway to set uh, in, the, in the cooperation uh, uh, field several issues that today are cutting edge, which does not mean that we could uh, add uh, additional in the future, um, but also linking this uh, to the way uh, through which our SMEs do business through public procurement processes and uh, in, in, in the sense of this level playing field also better compete by establishing cooperation frameworks in uh, the competition uh, field or competition policies field, sharing best uh, practices as well. In the next slide, um, how we wish to address uh, innovation um, by addressing disciplines on public domain, data innovation and open government data, and also recognizing the importance of uh, having uh, access to information in the public uh, domain. Um, one core element is the free flow of data uh, and sharing the data, uh, which enables innovation, should be at the very center of what this agreement guarantees to the parties. And also by recognizing strong mechanisms uh, in uh, trusted data sharing frameworks and open licensing agreements to facilitate this data sharing and promote its use in the, the digital environment. Finally, in the distance, in this uh, uh, aspect of innovation, um, um, uh, the agreement promotes the establishing of uh, government open data programs. And for this, uh, normative frameworks are established uh, to allow cooperation in ways of publishing uh, government data, including the identification of the type of relevant data, the development of new products, and the generation of open licensing models for this data. Um, in cooperation on MSMEs issues, um, this is very central given the inclusive approach and how it uh, becomes flesh right through our MISMIS. So uh, this module seeks to promote cooperation between the, uh, our agencies and how the SMEs will uh, share information and how the parties will enable that um, so that these, the benefits of this agreement can be fully uh, used and implemented in an easy and accessible way. So custom regulations, uh, procedures or contact points, regulations regarding data flows and innovation, how they could be at reach um, uh, in an easy way that certainly leverages in technology. Um, for that, we have also created a dialogue uh, of digital MISMIS, which is established um, and includes these uh, two also sides, the private uh, sector and the civil society to have a permanent um, um, uh, feedback uh, from these groups uh, and with the idea to keep this agreement responsive to the business reality of uh, this group um, and promoting the use certainly of the agreement. And the next slide also, I think it's very important to mention that uh, from the regional perspective, we have um, also uh, uh, launched an initiative which has gained a lot of traction within the Pacific Alliance, which is an integration group uh, comprised by Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile. So that in the declaration of Santiago last December, uh, we uh, staff presidents uh, of the PA established the digital regional market and uh, the uh, later on uh, roadmap uh, that was uh, already agreed a, a few months ago uh, with very specific uh, targets uh, to build a more robust digital infrastructure and create an environment that is conductive uh, to um, promoting uh, the exchange of, uh, of, uh, of goods. Um, 
And in the next slide, um, the digital regional market of the Pacific Alliance um, and this roadmap that I mentioned for the implementation of this uh, seeks to improve uh, the access uh, to digital e-commerce uh, to create an, uh, an enabling uh, environment to promote digital uh, commerce and to boost uh, digital economy to generate new sources of growth uh, and uh, productivity. So uh, to finish uh, my remarks in the next slide, I wish to address you know, the challenges that we see in the internalization, internationalization of, um, of the digital industry. And we see that DEPA and uh, the uh, MDR or the Digital Regional Market of the Pacific Alliance are key uh, agreements for the reactivation, uh, economic reactivation for our MISMIS. Um, that will boost its digitization and facilitate the export of uh, services and digital products. Once uh, they enter into force, um, the DEPA agreement um, uh, for Chile will enter into force probably in uh, one month or so fully, as we have already exchanged the ratification instruments. Uh, we hope that we can implement uh, fully these agreements, uh, aim uh, the targets that we set for them, but also to promote the future um, accession of uh, new countries to uh, these uh, agreements. Uh, we believe that uh, we have um, uh, been leading in the region uh, with this. The OECD last economic outlook recognizes this and specifically uh, mentions uh, the DEPA agreement as, uh, as, as one of the main reasons why Chile is leading in the region uh, in the digital economy uh, side. Um, because if they generate uh, an attractive ecosystem for international talent to develop the pro projects in, in uh, or from our country as a platform. Both um, agreements, I think, will allow, uh, like I said, to position uh, ourselves uh, at the forefront uh, of the design in the designing of rules uh, on innovative issues uh, of the digital economy. Um, and we expect uh, to keep delivering uh, for that. And our agenda is driven by uh, these uh, two agreements, uh, which certainly uh, does not uh, uh, fall, it doesn't uh, uh, stop uh, there. Uh, we do keep our work in the multilateral um, trading systems such as APEC um, and also uh, at the WTO in the negotiations of uh, e-commerce that are currently uh, taking uh, place. So with that, I finish my, my remarks. Um, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, the chance to share with you these uh, ideas. And uh, we hope to keep promoting, in, especially in the relation and the trade and economic relation with Canada, these uh, issues as we both share um, the goals of uh, making trade more inclusive, uh, sustainable, and responsive uh, for the needs uh, of, of our people and as a welfare generator uh, uh, for um, this new um, value that uh, brings the digital economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Rodrigo, for this very interesting presentation. Also to highlight for highlighting um, all the benefits of this, of this DEPA which we hope that Canada will soon uh, join formally. And um, I would like to start and I will invite the other panelists to come on, on the screen so we can start the, the, the session of questions and answers. Um, I would like to know, how do you think DEPA will help foster digital trade in ASEAN and the broader Asia Pacific region? And as you mentioned, Jonathan, we still have homework to do in order to, to uh, uh, update regulation, et cetera. So in order to implement these agreements, how do you think that we're ready and how quick do you think that we will be able to benefit from these trade agreements in the digital, with, um, with a digital, digital trade? I don't know if, if you wanna go on, Rodrigo, that you were the last one mentioning on the benefits and, and, and how we have to work on regulation as well to be able to implement uh, the DEPA? Well, DEPA um, is uh, something that was 
born and, and, and initiated in the margins of uh, our MRT meeting in Viña del Mar uh, in 2019, uh, during our APEC year. So it's not disconnected from the work that APEC uh, has been doing all these years and the roadmaps that uh, also we try to push uh, as uh, our uh, uh, chairmanship in, in, in APEC. Um, and that very symbolic, but yet I think uh, full of, uh, of content um, a milestone means that uh, DIPA um, is something that uh, uh, was, uh, you know, thought by members of the Asia Pacific community and where um, the expansion of this uh, kind of trade has been also extremely uh, significant. significant. Um, so we believe that, uh, and um, again, I mean, this dynamic that Singapore and New Zealand uh, uh, with us uh, had with the DIPA is not no different than the very, you know, original P4 dynamic in terms of being very ambitious and look and, 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 uh, and on forward thinkers trying to look for path, um, you know, uh, pathfinders for uh, avenues to get more and more countries and economies um, within uh, uh, this agreement. So I'm very confident that the DIPA will uh, create uh, traction among countries, uh, a new member to uh, or new country, you know, Canada, South Korea, again, two members of APEC and two, you know, Pacific nations. Uh, have also been joining. So um, I'm very confident that we will keep uh, looking at countries and, and, and uh, from the Pacific Rim to join and uh, throughout the implementation process, it will just be a matter of time that we see DEPA as a key instrument to boost uh, digital trade within this region. Thank you so much, uh, Rodrigo. Do you have anything to add or comment, uh, Jonathan or Bart, or, or we go? to the following question that we have. Jeff Reeves that wants to pose a question as well for you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for your, uh, your fascinating uh, comments and, and presentations today. I think we could continue this discussion around all of these events for, for uh, many, many hours afterwards. I'd like to uh, throw a, a bit of a curveball or a little, little bit of a... Um, uh, a, an unrelated but also related question to the panelists, particularly around an issue that's been uh, in the media much recently, and that's the role of, of cryptocurrency uh, and the emergence of cryptocurrency as a, a financial and a political force within and between states and its potential to alter traditional banking and financing industries and indeed state society relations in, in many fundamental ways. I'd like to, to add two specific questions to that. First is, and this is for, for all of the speakers. Now, how do we understand cryptocurrency's role in, in digital trade and finance? And how can we account for the differences in, in state views and treatments of crypto? With of course, El Salvador's adoption of Bitcoin as a national currency on one side, and China and South Korea's clampdown on crypto uh, development and companies on the other. And then the second part of that question is, do you think the push by countries such as China to develop their own digital currencies could eventually challenge the dollar's predominance in global finance? And is there more of a desire for a digital alternative to the dollar due to the US administration's use of sanctions or the weaponization of the dollar, particularly under uh, the Obama, Trump, and Biden administrations? Maybe I'll start and uh, defer to my uh, fellow uh, panelists. Um, I think. First of all, you need to separate uh, Bitcoin as a, as a, or related cryptocurrencies uh, and the uh, Facebook led uh, effort to establish Libra uh, as an example uh, for private transactions on the one hand from uh, the notion of a central bank issued digital currency on the other. On the latter, uh, it's fair to say there's a tremendous amount of uh, thinking going on both within central banks and among them under the auspices of the Bank for International Settlements and uh, 
its recently created technology hub. Uh, most all uh, governments are saying not until and unless we're satisfied that the interests of financial stability uh, are uh, protected. Bank of Canada is certainly among uh, the leaders on that. I notice we have Bob Fay, uh, former Bank of Canada official from the Centre for International Governance Innovation uh, as a participant here who may wish uh, to chime in. Uh, versus uh, units of account that private traders uh, may wish to use. BART will know better than me, but uh, according to recent numbers I've read, there's very little to suggest that the primacy of the US dollar as the unit for international transaction is uh, under threat. It may be declining a bit. Uh, some are turning to euro denominated and a fewer are turning to renminbi uh, denominations to assess the values of uh, their transaction. Uh, so uh, I don't see in the, in the short to medium term future uh, uh, a real threat uh, to the manner in which uh, transactions uh, even conducted uh, digitally are, are uh, disrupting uh, the international financial system. Uh, that leads to another dimension, which is you've got to separate in discussion the notion of blockchain as a means of securing your transaction to which currency or denomination is actually incorporated into that secure means of uh, transmission. But I defer to Bart and Rodrigo and maybe Bob Fay if he wants to chime in uh, for better insight. Well, I don't know about better insight, but I, I would first off like to associate myself with uh, all of Jonathan's uh, observations there and just add uh, one of the, the continuing risks to cryptocurrencies, whether it be Bitcoin or any, any other, um, is the, what kind of regulations are created at the national and international level. So there's naturally some skepticism in a number of countries, uh, particularly central banks, uh, to this challenge, this competition from crypto. So uh, it, it's hard to say with any kind of certainty what will be the, the next steps in regulation, which is coming, part in, coming about in part because of concerns about the nefarious use of cryptocurrency for uh, money laundering and drug trade, et cetera. So um, that it, it, it's regulation that strikes me as one of the greatest threats to, to crypto. Um, the, the role of uh, you know, Chinese digital currency, well, for some of the reasons just outlined, the US dollar, there's no reason to think that it's gonna be the, the primary currency forever and ever and ever. And China's growing economy, depending on what it does with foreign exchange controls, et cetera, over time. Yeah, it could rise, but I don't see creating a digital currency is suddenly gonna change its position dramatically, particularly when other countries are also thinking about digital currencies. I'd like actually to, to jump back to the question that Laredo asked um, about uh, DEPA and, and opportunities for expansion. I would say very briefly that um, I think you will find a lot of like-minded countries think of market-oriented democracies, good rule of law, uh, higher income, uh, joining with DEPA or creating similar types of agreements. I, I referred to in my opening remarks on, on EU aspirations to negotiate agreements with uh, some more of the more advanced economies in Asia and the U.S. has visions of an Indo-Pacific uh, DEPA type uh, instrument. Um, so I expect that to happen, but also note within ASEAN, there are ongoing discussions of creating among the ASEAN countries, not just those at the forefront like Singapore, some kind of uh, agreements on digital trade in the next four years. That will be challenged by very different types of governance and, and levels of development. If you're talking Singapore and Malaysia, it's one thing. If you're talking Myanmar and Laos, it's quite another. Uh, a country like Indonesia um, continues to inhibit digital trade by maintaining rapidly changing and often opaque data related regulations. Now the government has decreased some of these restrictions, allowing commercial banks and insurance companies to transfer and store some, some data offshore, but recent legislation has been largely protectionist. And as I mentioned also, Singapore is negotiating with Vietnam 
on a on a digital trade agreement. But whether or not that progresses in the near future, we'll see because Vietnam also continues to impede international trade and digital services. So it will be a challenge to get all the countries on board in ASEAN uh, with any kind of agreement that has you know at any high standard. But like-minded countries with you know, similar economies, market-oriented, what have you, uh, the Chile's, New Zealand's, Australia's, and Canada's, U.S., uh, Japan, Korea, uh, expect uh, much movement involving these countries on digital trade agreements. I might just add yeah. as, as, a, as a footnote, there is a signed and enforced ASEAN agreement on electronic commerce. It was signed in 2019. Um, I'm not current on whether all ASEAN members have brought it into force. As Bart, you suggested, it's not as high a standard or as ambitious as the DEPA, but uh, in the name of the long-term ASEAN is at least a, a floor or foundation, which goes back to the risk of spaghetti bowl uh, overlapping uh, standards uh, emerging. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Um, we're almost getting an, an, at, at the end of, of, of this um, webinar, but um, I would like to ask you, um, how relevant do you think could digital trade be for the export of services, which is something very important for, uh, for many of our countries, in countries like Canada and, and Chile, especially? I don't know if maybe Rodrigo could go ahead or... Um, well, this is, um, DEPA, is, DEPA is part of the agenda that facilitates the export of uh, services in Chile. And many of the issues that have been raised uh, as questions also are very practical. And some of them, you know, uh, are not part, and we have to recognize, you know, uh, DEPA, financial instruments, uh, uh, for instance, uh, and, and the role of uh, cryptocurrencies and what they could play to make precisely trade um, uh, more generally, digital trade more inclusive. It's, um, it's very interesting, uh, nevertheless, to, to, to raise this. And, um, but we see this as a, as a central uh, piece of uh, our strategy, um, which, talk, which, which has to enable a level playing field uh, to our SMEs. And DIPA will play, we believe, an important role in that. Um, maybe, and we, certainly it, it will fall fall short to uh, the challenges that will keep arising in this uh, sector, but it does not mean that uh, we cannot uh, address them in the, in the future. Um, you have mentioned issues uh, important, uh, such as platform liability, for instance, not related with services, but which is not incorporated in DEPA, but uh, there are issues uh, or rules, for instance, in competition which uh, uh, also uh, could be thought, you know, for platforms. And, uh, and therefore I think uh, it sets the seeds in many aspects which can be developed develop in the future. But, um, but we are convinced that uh, DIPA is uh, and will be crucial to facilitate and promote and boost the export uh, of services in, in Chile which is very uh, far from its potential and uh, in terms of, com of competitive measures, what other similar countries are doing. Uh, we believe that it could export much more services. And uh, we think that the, the level playing field that DEPA incorporates will be pretty instrumental to boost this kind of, uh, of uh, export. Thank you so much, um, Rodrigo. And unfortunately, we have many, many other questions. Uh, I would have loved to hear more about the 3GPP that mentioned Jonathan, that seems like it's gonna play a major role in, in, in deciding many of, of, of the rules or, or regulations that may come uh, together with the, all this implementation of these agreements. But we have to conclude, we will, maybe we'll have another chance to discuss further these issues. Uh, I would like to thank you all of you, but we have some very important closing remarks by Jeff Reeves, who's gonna finish this webinar today. So Jeff, please, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Loretto. And thank you to all the speakers. You know, uh, just hearing your comments, I think it's it's clear that digital trade and the integration of technology and traditional commercial manufacturing and, and finance sectors has a near limitless potential to transform the way people interact, the way we produce and consume goods, and the relations that we have with, with the state. You know, between states, digital trade also clearly has the potential to drive closer cooperation on issues around standards developments and FTAs. But it also seems there's the potential to create parallel systems of competing standards that could, left unmanaged, lead to tensions within the international system. Now, I think while we're clearly in the early days of digital adoption, it's equally clear that events such as the pandemic are forcing social adoption of things like e-commerce and the digitalization of supply chains in ways that we couldn't have predicted two years ago. Uh, to make sure that the digital revolution remains a net positive for states and societies, we need to be proactive in thinking through the standards and systems through which we'll manage them as well as their social implications, which obviously are clearly huge. So events like today uh, serve both the purpose of informing the general public and moving forward debates about how we should work together to ensure effective protocols, procedures, and regulations. And to this end, I'd like to, to thank our panelists for serving both an academic and a social good with, with their comments. So thank you very much, Mr. Bart Eddies, Mr. Jonathan Freed, Mr. Rodrigo Yenez. Thank you for your thoughts today and for helping us make sense of the opportunities and challenges around digital trade and all the issues associated with digital trade. Thank you as well to Mr. Alex Peso for your scene setting comments. Please join me in giving the speakers a round of virtual applause. Now, before we wrap up today, I'd like to thank the Chile Pacific Foundation for their ongoing partnership. The events that we've hosted with the foundation have been a pleasure. They've been both informative and they've both been a, an excellent exercise uh, of our memorandum of understanding to, to come together, to work together, to share ideas and to think about how Canada and Chile can be more proactive in shaping our bilateral relationships with respect to engagement in the Asia Pacific. Uh, we have our final event coming up uh, in several weeks or two weeks now on the 27th of September around China's BRI and some of the regional thinking around China's engagement through the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, we look forward to that as well. Um, with that, I can conclude today's comments. Thank you for everyone's attendance and we look forward to continuing our discussion with the Chile Pacific Foundation. Thank you very much. Goodbye, have a nice day to all of you, Bart, Jonathan, Rodrigo, and Jeff. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Loretto, and thanks uh, to the panelists. Thank you very much, Jeff. The same for you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Pierre, sorry. <laughs>